Well, my name is Eric Ruthford. Again, I am a, a PLU graduate. I was a student here uh, 15 years ago. Back then, uh, Dr. Menzel was our provost, and I interviewed him as um, a student newspaper reporter, and going and talking to Dr. Menzel was kind of a, a big, scary deal, and so being up here on, on the panel uh, with him is uh, quite, uh, quite an honor, so it is uh, uh, very, good to, uh, very good to be here. Um, the aspect of the subject or of the value of life that I'm going to talk about uh, relates to um, the uh, premature birth of our uh, son, uh, Gabriel, who was born at 22 weeks and six days of gestation, which is uh, 17 weeks premature. And to give you an idea of what that involved, I'm going to play you a, a short video um, that we took um, when he was two days old. I'm off the dopamine now. That's what Mary was saying. That yes, and that means his heart is keeping his blood pressure up at the right level by itself. Okay. And uh, there's, um, his blood is a little on the acidic side, so okay. we have sodium bicarbonate for that. Already he's getting baking soda, huh? Yeah. And he's been getting a lot of transfusions lately, um, just because, well, his body only has about three tablespoons of blood in it. Is that all? Yeah. Three tablespoons, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that video, the, the voices are, are my own and my father's as we're standing and talking about uh, his condition. Um, the, um, I, I should uh, tell you uh, that this story does have a happy ending, so showing people a video um, of, that, uh, of that kind uh, can be pretty upsetting, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that part later on. Um, the, the doctors did not want to get uh, to the point where we were uh, when we uh, had, uh, that you saw in that video, with uh, Gabriel having been resuscitated and uh, having been um, uh, given the breathing tube and all of the um, various uh, catheters and um, tubes and wires that were uh, attached to him. Um, on the day that Miri gave birth, at 22 weeks and six days of gestation, um, at about six o'clock, her water had broken, so we knew that uh, birth was imminent. We'd been waiting for nine days, hoping to, uh, to wait or to extend the pregnancy to the point where we could get to, say, 24 weeks or maybe 25 weeks of gestation when uh, chances would have been better, but it was clear we were going to have the birth uh, at 22 and six days. So at 6.30, we had a visit from a neonatologist, and neonatology is the subspecialty of uh, pediatrics that deals with extremely premature infants. And the doctor uh, came, and uh, what he said was, I don't recommend that babies should be treated at this stage because the results are so poor. If you give birth after midnight, I'll be the one who comes and does the resuscitation, but my heart won't fully be in it. This uh, statement from the doctor um, that he recommended against resuscitation even if we did make it to 23 weeks and zero days was somewhat stressful to us. Uh, the hospital, Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, happens to be the largest uh, baby hospital in the state, um, had a policy, and I, I believe the policy's changed since then, but the policy was that um, 23 weeks and zero days was the um, limit, the lower limit at which um, the hospital would resuscitate a preemie. Um, the statement of the doctor caused us considerable stress in that we were worried that the doctor might not show up on time um, or, or that we would uh, have the baby early and that there would be no one there to help him. In the end, um, Gabriel was born at 11.20 p.m. The doctor came and decided to round up, and his official gestational age did remain 22 weeks and six days, but he was close enough to being 23 and zero that they were willing to uh, resuscitate. So then I need to use this thing for the first time. Oh, and it does work. So then this um, poses, um, the first question this poses is one, can he do that? Refuse to provide care when uh, the parents want it? And the answer is yes. 
um, doctors are not required to provide care that they believe is futile. Um, what I've included here is an excerpt from the Neonatal Resuscitation Program Clinical Guidelines um, produced by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is the governing body that um, sets standards for pediatricians in the United States. And uh, this is the, the guidelines on when to resuscitate. So I'll read this. They say you're not supposed to read from PowerPoint slides, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, when gestation, birth weight, or congenital anomalies are associated with an almost certain early death and when unacceptably high morbidity is likely among the rare survivors, resuscitation is not indicated. Examples include extreme prematurity, gestational age of less than 23 weeks, or a birth weight of less than 400 grams. And then it lists a couple of other abnormalities uh, that are also um, uh, in included. Now the bolded words there, resuscitation is not indicated. Not indicated is a medical journal speak for it's something that you should not do. Gabriel's weight was 652 grams. Um, which put him in the 97th percentile uh, for size at his birth. Um, they blame that on me, if you can believe that. Um, and so, um, the, um, let's see, what else to say? Oh, the one other thing to point out about this is these guidelines are for 2010. Uh, keep your eyes on in the news. Um, in the middle of the month, I believe October 14th or October 15th, the American Academy of Pediatrics is scheduled to come out with a new set of standards um, that uh, they haven't said exactly what's going to be in them, but I believe it will include uh, more flexibility on the topic of uh, resuscitation for uh, babies in the 22nd week. I am, um, of course, very much of the opinion that, that this, is, this should happen. So then the next question is, uh, why would he say that, um, that, he, that the baby should not be resuscitated? And indeed, babies born at that level are in extreme danger. Um, these statistics show um, a study from Japan in which in the 22nd week, 63% um, of preemies born um, in, in, died before they could leave the hospital. Um, and then um, when you add in the additional outcome of uh, profound neurodevelopmental uh, impairment, um, you have 73%. Uh, um, profound uh, neurodevelopmental impairment is the uh, highest um, level of impairment, and it's talking about someone who is um, basically almost unresponsive or um, close to or, or a very limited, limited function. In the 22nd week, 12% could emerge with minimal or no impairment. And there are other levels of lesser impairment in there that I didn't include on in the slide just to make it easier to read. As you can see, um, as you get uh, just another week, um, chances improve uh, quite a bit more. And then once you get up to the 25th week, um, it's 14% of the preemies will, um, died in that study. And 24% had either died or had profound uh, neuro developmental uh, impairment. I've included these uh, Japanese statistics because they're the nice statistics. Um, the American statistics that were quoted to us when we were in um, the uh, antepartum unit, or the, the unit where they hold you before you give birth, um, were even gloomier than that. The American statistics were, were gloomier. Um, partially because they were old and also because in um, Japan, 22-week um, uh, preemies have been routinely resuscitated since the 1990s. Um, over here, it's been a hodgepodge of um, policies and attitudes by the doctors um, that uh, determines that. So it, the survival rates over here vary uh, quite widely. We need to talk about the concept of futility. What does that um, imply? Uh, futility is, in a medical sense, is defined as care unlikely to benefit the patient. Um, and that's pretty easy to see, that, that you're providing care that's not going to have any effect. The other is that it's treatment to provide poor quality of benefit. And uh, that is the category we were getting into with um, our son um, that the doctors were concerned about, that um, even if he did survive, um, he was so likely to be uh, severely impaired. 
And um, for the, uh, it, with this, this question also comes into play with the resuscitation of an adult. Um, there has to be a time limit at which the doctors are willing to give up on uh, resuscitating a non-responsive patient. Um, whatever that time limit may be, given that's appropriate for that age level of patient, you could say, well, we, if we continue this for 15 minutes, um, we can stop and then declare the patient dead. Or we, if you continue further beyond 15 minutes, there is a small percentage of patients who will self-recover and a spontaneous heartbeat will begin. But at that point, the um, patient's... Um, is almost certain to be brain dead uh, because of the deprivation of oxygen uh, to the brain. And so in that case, you would have provided a poor quality of uh, benefit. You're in something of a time crunch uh, when it comes to the delivery of an extremely premature infant. You have to decide before the birth what you're, going to do, what you're going to do. There isn't really time to examine the child at birth and to say whether, um, you, you know, and then to ask uh, the mother, do you want to do this, do you not want to do it? There's just no time to think about it. Um, the resuscitation that's involved goes far beyond standard um, CPR. Um, it involves a ventilator tube down the throat. It involves um, IV catheters, medication, uh, medicines, pretty, some of them pretty harsh, uh, put into um, in these catheters immediately. Um, and it's also adding to this paradox of the time crunch is that the baby uh, was just fine before birth in most cases. There are some cases where the baby has to be born um, quickly because of a problem in the womb, but in our case and in most cases, uh, that's not what's going on. Um, and our, uh, so the, the notion of futility here uh, relates to something that has not happened yet um, to, the, to the patient. It's very likely to happen, but it hasn't happened. So you're stuck in a, uh, a paradox in well, how do you interpret the future. This is especially compounded by the fact that um, doctors are not uh, able to predict uh, which children are likely to survive and which are not. A study recently, uh, was, or a few years ago, was given to neonatologists where they were shown videos of premature births and asked which births uh, or which babies are most likely to survive and which ones are not. And their predictions were about as good as a coin flip. This opens up uh, what you could call a window of death. You could uh, either an opportunity or perhaps a temptation, depending on what you want to call it, in which someone could be allowed to uh, pass away and you take an action knowing that the result will be uh, the patient's death. It's not quite the same as assisted suicide, but at the same time, your intentions are basically the same. The person will pass away. Um, to us, this seemed um, similar to the dilemma that occurs when um, a diagnosis of Down syndrome is given uh, during a pregnancy. 67% of Down syndrome babies are aborted in this country uh, when, they're, when Down syndrome is detected in the womb, either through ultrasound or amniocentesis. So how is it that you interpret uh, this decision at the birth of a, a premature child? Are you walk, um, are you taking advantage of the disabled at their weakest, or are you redu reducing the uh, suffering of someone who is likely to die? Um, let's see. One thing um, I, I want to add about the um, Down syndrome uh, question is that that uh, very fact that uh, the, the Down syndrome babies are um, often aborted in our culture. Uh, made us especially suspicious of the doctors when they uh, told us that it was um, uh, better uh, not to resuscitate him, not to try to have him live. Um, just the general attitude towards the disabled in this regard, uh, we were afraid that uh, our son could fall prey to that same uh, attitude towards, towards the life of the disabled. We also need to think about autonomy of the patient uh, versus beneficence. Um, autonomy um, at the beginning of a pregnancy is a rather easy question in that the mother is autonomous, able to make uh, her own decisions about what she wants in her care. Um, and also um, the autonomy, the health of the mother is the primary concern. 
uh, mid-pregnancy, uh, that model has to change as the uh, child gets to the point at which uh, survival is um, possible. Um, it changes to balancing maternal fetal uh, best interests um, or best interests or beneficence. Who uh, gets to decide on behalf of the child? Uh, the doctors, the parents, the state. It uh, becomes a negotiation. And this negotiation is uh, very hard. And to uh, allow me to play, to, to illustrate this, allow me to place the dilemma of this baby, who is not autonomous, onto an adult who is autonomous. For example, if you have breast cancer patients who have a 30% chance of uh, survival, uh, but the doctor says he won't provide care because it's uh, just not worth trying, um, a doctor in that case would probably uh, would probably not be allowed uh, to say such a thing. If you were to tell adult patients um, that they have a fatal condition with a 30% chance of survival, a five-month treatment, very uncomfortable, and disability is likely, uh, will they say yes uh, to the treatment? Um, would I say yes to um, five months of treatment with an uh, endotracheal tube down my throat? I uh, honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, and so, um, as parents and as doctors of an extremely premature infant, um, you're placed into, uh, ha you're, you're having to impose a decision upon um, this, this child um, who has a right to life, but uh, may um, also, uh, the, the suffering uh, is, it also has to be considered. And then um, there is the question of how early is, uh, is it, are you talking about things being truly premature? I have argued um, that um, hospitals and doctors should be more flexible in the 22nd week than they have been. However, um, there is uh, eventually a wall that you will hit um, at which it is hopeless or, or nearly hopeless for uh, the survival of the child. If, if I uh, am successful in getting hospitals to be more flexible on the 22nd week, then uh, what about uh, the 21st week, at which point there might be a 3% chance of survival? Um, is it worth uh, trying at that point? I don't have the answer to that question. And then another question um, this um, brings up is uh, medical technologists are trying to build a uh, artificial placenta or a uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation device which effectively which can temporarily do the work of the heart and the lungs and then um, you can place this child um, on this device into artificial amniotic fluid. Um, it would be a, a very intensive, very uh, difficult um, procedure for the child, um, but it could be done and you could save life with it. So then you're, you're going to need some kind of a, a framework um, in which uh, to, um, to, to process these, these new uh, technologies and, and these new advancements as they come. The belief system of the families involved is also uh, very important. In our case, uh, we believe that, that uh, life that only, that only lasts a few days is beautiful, glorifies God, even if it includes suffering, and we were willing to take that chance, and we didn't feel like, we ha um, like someone who tries to preserve life um, but, but fails uh, has to apologize for, for that failure or feel that they, they've done something wrong. Um, the doctor's recommendation that we shouldn't um, intubate um, felt at times like an alternative utilitarian religion competing for the dominance of our family. I don't think it's quite fair to say that about the doctors. I don't believe that was their intention. Um, but when uh, there's this sort of, uh, as Christians, there's this sort of uh, separation of church and state that you keep in your life uh, to relate to the secular world, um, and that kind of that, that, that separation breaks down when the uh, life of a family member is on the line. I should uh, add here that uh, that was our uh, decision, uh, that, the, the way that we processed this decision. However, Another family saying, I could, could um, say, um, I love my child enough to let him go. I love my child so much that I'm not going to poke him full of holes and uh, inflict very uncomfortable treatment on him for three months. Um, I would disagree with that decision. However, it is a mature thinking um, that may be um, 
uh, congruent with um, another family's uh, belief system. So since uh, we've gotten uh, out of the hospital, we've become um, something of advocates um, for uh, babies stuck in this uh, in-between space, um, writing letters to Swedish's ethics committee and to the ethics committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And um, I've also written an editorial to, to the journal Pediatrics um, that I'm going to submit next month. I hope they publish it. And we're asking them to be more flexible about 22-weekers, uh, um, to use statistics less. They give you categories of uh, death, um, uh, profound to severe uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, and uh, moderate to severe um, neurodevelopmental impairment, which when you're in crisis and you're feeling horribly guilty about how things have been falling apart, and uh, you feel like you've done something to cause uh, this premature uh, birth, they sound like death or life without parole. Um, and then I would also encourage um, the inclusion of a physical or an occupational therapist in uh, the counseling that occurs before a birth. Um, those people are the ones who deal with uh, these babies after they have left. Um, um, after they have left the intensive care unit, and then um, ha getting these children uh, caught up so that they can go to school someday, um, which is uh, something that we have done with, uh, with Gabriel, and it has gone uh, quite well. So um, that is uh, the end of uh, what I've, uh, I've prepared to say. Um, I guess the, the happy uh, ending of the, of the story is that G Gabriel did uh, come out of this okay, and um, he, he's back there. Uh, I don't know if he's going to say anything, but... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You want to come sit with me, Gabriel? Okay. All right. No. No, you don't want to sit with me? <laughs> or you want me to sit down? Or you want a hug? Okay. Oh, you're going to go see Mommy again. Okay. So... Um, Briefly stated, um, he's got some linguistic uh, um, delays. He is um, um, stuck on purees for eating, um, has some sensory issues that prevent that. Um, we've, got, we've had quite a bit of therapy since we left the hospital, and we're hopeful of both physical and, and um, feeding therapy. And we're quite hopeful that um, with enough catch-up, we'll, we'll be able to get him into kindergarten or caught up by kindergarten. Or, um, <laughs> or um, perhaps put him in kindergarten a, a, a year late. So uh, that's the uh, end of my talk. <laughs>